it is Bailey from Farmer Bailey. I was going to say Farmer Bailey plugs, but increasingly that's not accurate. It's Farmer Bailey plugs and perennials and now woody plants. We're going to talk a lot about woody plants today. Um, Carl from Green Park Nurseries up in Canada, um, probably the most knowledgeable person I know about, um, you know, berry, woody plants for cutting berries, um, flowers, sticks. They call him the stick man. We'll talk all about it. Um, but it's five o'clock somewhere and that somewhere happens to be here in Madeira, Portugal. So cheers. Uh, Thomas has made me a spicy passion fruit margarita. Passion fruit is called maracujá here in Portugal. So uh, I'm going to take a little sip of this. It's a bit spicy, so I probably will have to go kind of slow. Mm. Delicious. It's going <clears> to <throat> also introduce you to the newest member of our family. This is little Princesa. She's a, a rescue dog that we got from the shelter last week. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's Princesa. You might have seen Chuck and Chauncey, our other dogs. Everyone's doing very well. Um, announcements. This is the last week to order Gerberas. If you are looking for Gerberas from Grow and Sell, get your order in this week. Otherwise, um, yeah, if you haven't got your Lysianthus order in, don't wait too much longer. We still have capacity at Grow and Sell and at Plug Connection, um, but I imagine that will be stopping pretty soon. Um, great. With that, we're just going to get Carl on here and talk about some woody plants. Well, he... Uh... Hopefully we'll join, join us here in a second. Hey, there you are. Hey, hey everyone. Carl. Good, yourself? I'm great. I don't recall the last time I saw you, but uh, I always enjoy watching what you're doing by Instagram. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's been a while. Um, Carl, yeah. how do you say your last name? Varmeyer. So, uh, so pretend the H isn't there. Okay, <clears throat> that's what I thought, but I, uh, I wanted to make you say it first. Yeah. Um, so I had the pleasure of visiting your farm, what, five, six years ago with yeah. the ASCFC? Yeah, I think it's been five years. It's, it's been okay. a little while. Yeah, it was before the additions happened and everything happened. So yeah, yeah, and it's probably been about five years. Um, I know some of the crops that you grow, but why don't you run, run, run down the list because you have you yeah, have you have a lot of all of them, but not yeah, not, not the huge there, range, right? There, there's a lot of everything. Um, usually, how I do this is I go through the seasons. So, uh, in January, February, March, we're into a lot of pussy willow, forsythia, um, curly willow, fantail willow, and then as we transition to our spring flowers, then we're into the cut lilacs, um, cut viburnum, snowball. Um, Spirea, mock orange, and then we actually have summers off. So by the 15th of June, we're done for the season, for shipping season. Then we start again in the middle of August with peach hydrangeas. We go into uh, cotinus. That's when our snowberries start coming on crop. Um, yeah, and then uh, and then the fall season. In the fall season, we go back into curly willow. And we go into dogwood branches, ilex. <laughs> So that's uh, a little bit of what we do here on the farm. Lots of woodies. Lots of woodies. Um, woodies take up a lot of space, but I think even if you've got a small space, you have room for a few woodies. Um, the biggest right. hurdle, I think, has been that people needed to buy, you know, a full pallet worth of plants to get going with woodies. And that's been something I've worked on for years, and I finally found a solution uh, working with Colster. We'll talk about them in just a minute yep. also. Um, I gotta say we had some really, uh, really strong response to the Woody program, and thank you for reaching out to offer, you know, yeah. some of your expertise on the topic as well. Well, and me personally, because of the size of the grower that I am, I am able to purchase those large quantities, and, and I've always wanted everyone to be able to get these varieties in their hands. But yeah, it's hard when you play that small-time farm with big companies that are growing these bare root plants. So. Uh, no, it's been great to see you take this initiative also, Bailey. Um, I've known of Colster for many years, visited them. Yeah. I don't remember the first time I visited their farm, but when I'm in Holland, 
you know, looking for new seeds, new bulbs, new whatever. Yeah. Their display is always beautiful, nice people, um, and I love their products, but it's just been a lot of, lot of logistics to figure out how yes. to get them to America. So we're really happy that that's finally happening. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so let's kind of go down, let's talk about a few, a few crops. Um, maybe we'll kind of go in the season as well. Um, you mentioned, you mentioned Philadelphia, mock orange. Yes. Um, are you, are you growing the culture variety? I'm sure the culture will be similar regardless. Yes. So it is similar. Um, we are only growing the snowbell variety right now. Okay. Um, that double, uh, double mock orange, very similar to the one that Culster does. Um, the reason we don't grow the Culster variety is because it actually blooms two weeks later than the snowbell. Okay. So, and we value our summers and our time off. <laughs> and snowbell mock orange is our last crop for the season. And when we talked about maybe extending our season by two weeks, everyone said, nope. By the 15th of June, we want to be done. We don't want to go to the end of June. So, um, but absolutely, I've seen Colster's variety in bloom at their farm and uh, it, it is a magical variety. Absolutely. Excellent. So what, what kind of spacing do you put on your Philadelphus? So Philadelphus, um, we have our rows, they're six feet in between rows and we plant, um, about a foot and a half, two feet in between the plants themselves in the rows. Okay, so, fair, so fairly, fairly close. Fairly close. Um, it does seem, because, because it's our last crop harvested, we prune them right after we're done harvesting June. So we have to be able to promote that growth through our summer months and whatever stem length you get through the summer growing months is determines your length for next year's harvest. Great. <clears throat> so I know the, the culture variety is uh, re-blooming, but I think you're probably going to get your best harvest on the first cut. And those yeah. flowers are formed on the stems that grew the previous year. Yeah, um, absolutely. absolutely. We tried to do a little talk about these a couple weeks ago, but uh, I couldn't post photos, so it got cut a little bit short. That's right. That's right. So let's talk about new wood versus old wood. Um, that's kind of an issue with most woody plants, especially those that need to flower. And anything that has a berry has to flower before it can have the berry. So some things will grow, will bloom on new wood. Um, yeah. Paniculata hydrangea comes to mind as something that blooms on new growth. Yes, yes. But most of the rest of these are blooming on old wood. So we'll, we'll talk about that as we go. So yeah. let me just, if you're new to this concept, new wood, it means it blooms on the current season's growth and old wood, it blooms on the growth from the previous year. Sometimes even the year before that and the year before that. But we're really, you know, on a more production scale talking about, is it blooming on this year's growth or last year's growth? And that will inform us on how we prune these things. Yeah. Um, excellent. So I guess in terms of the products from Colster that we're selling, um, snowberry or my, mock orange will be first. Yeah. And then let me just pull up my, my list here so I make sure I don't skip anybody. Um, I guess probably some for a carpus. Most of what we're selling is going to be summer to autumn. Yeah. Uh, well, now, now we're into the berries. So uh, are you growing some Sephora carpus? We are. So um, about six years ago, five, five, six years ago, then I was actually in Holland and I got to visit Coster also. Um, got to sit down with Peter. Um, a little bit of backstory. I had uh, an older gentleman who immigrated from Holland about 20 years ago and lives in Canada now. And I actually asked him if he would take me to Holland knowing that he was, um, grew up in Boscope himself as a kid wow. and, and early married. So he knew everyone there. So he was my ticket into a lot of these places. And that's actually how I got to meet um, Ulster and come visit their place. And so we set up uh, our initial first order with a couple hundred of each variety. Cause at that point we didn't know if they would work in the North American market. This was still all new. So we were also guinea pigs um, back then just to try it out. So uh, yeah, and then Snowberry was on that list. We had um, Magical Treasure, Magical White Dream, and Magical Pride okay. uh, come in. Those were our initial ones. And then a couple years after that, then we went into Magical Temptation, more Magical White Dream, um, Autumn's Blush, um, Ruby Giant, 
and Ruby Falls. Yeah. Does that make yeah. sense? Ruby Falls. So yeah. those those are the varieties that we have in our ground growing now. So excellent. So let me just do a little sidebar here. So Colster is this breeder of well of, of a lot of things, but they've traditionally been in, heavy in the hydrangeas and other woody plants. Um, you know, for the garden and, and potted market even. But they were smart enough to realize that sometimes when you breed, you know, you're growing out thousands of plants. You have some that are maybe a little too tall. Maybe they're a little too vigorous. They, don't, they would outgrow your normal landscape. And being smart people, they said that has potential in the cut flower trade. They're not far from Alzmir, which is where, you know, all the cut flowers in the world, not all, a lot of them flow through. Um, so they really also selected for cutting potential at the same time as they're breeding for other qualities. Um, I don't know of anyone else who's really done that in a big way, so I really appreciate their work. And I think these are probably some of the best specimens that we can get if you are looking at them from the cut standpoint. Um, so Synthorocarpus is snowberry or coralberry, depending on maybe the color or where you're from or the species. There's a lot of different species, all native to North America. Um, Tell me about your season. Do you have them over a several so, month period? Yeah. So, um, oh, and we also have avalanche, which okay. is basically the earliest one. It is, it is amazing. And we start usually up here. We're zone six now. It's so hard to stay on top of these different zones. We're kind of in this little microclimate where we are. Uh, we'll start with avalanche usually about the 20th, 25th of August. Okay. And we'll go right through September and usually midway through October. Okay. So it is almost an eight week, eight week, eight, nine week season. And even our last harvest, we did have a hard frost where all the dahlia growers were done for the season and we still did one more harvest of snowberry. So they are, uh, they are quite resilient and uh, yeah, it's, it's been an amazing crop. Um, to let every, everyone know, with snowberry, um, we learned out the hard way. Be prepared for mildew. Okay. Be prepared for mildew. Um, depending on how you farm, whether you're organic or whether you have a spray program in place, um, we'll leave that up to the individual grower. But um, we learned the hard way last year. We got hit with mildew very hard, and we harvested hardly any snowberry last year. Okay. So... Um, just keep that in the back of your mind. Um, they, they are prone. And I think a lot of it has to do with a little bit of climate change. Um, we were used to having hot summer evenings and hot summer days. Now in July, during the growing season, when they're growing, we're getting down with cooler temperatures and during the evenings and uh, hot temperatures still during the day. So those swings in temperatures here mildew is taking over so just just prepared for that and be conscious of that okay, so uh tell everyone where where you are in canada okay so we are in ontario canada um we are in the niagara region so if you're in the united states we are just north of buffalo and we're just south of toronto and our farm is sandwiched um right in between lake erie and lake ontario so we have okay. lake to our north and Lake Erie to our south. Great. So obviously those lakes are really moderating your climate. Yeah. Um, probably also increasing, you're probably fairly humid summers there. We do. Very humid. Very humid. So the mildew is going to be obviously a problem. More of a, most fungal issues are a problem with higher humidity. So where I was in Vermont, we would have really quite dry days um, in the first half of the year. So I never recall having mildew issues on my Symphoricarpus. But if you live in a place that is perpetually, you know, humid, um, that's really good advice to keep an eye out for it. You know, yeah. be, be prepared for it. Figure out your plan of action. Because oftentimes by the time you start seeing symptoms, you yeah. either you should have started treating already. And, and, and that being said, the leaves on varieties, um, I don't know how many people are accustomed to the native snowberry varieties or the older variety where the leaves got black spots and fell off and shriveled up. These varieties are um the leaf quality on them is second to none. Okay, so you're shipping them with leaves on, you're not defoliating nope. or anything like nope. that? No, everything is shipped with leaves on them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've always, I found them really to be quite simple to grow. I mean, we have fairly yep. heavy clay soil. They don't mind a good bit of water. Um, and I just sort of chopped them any which way I wanted, yep. and they seem to recover and be pretty happy with that decision. <laughs> yeah, and, 
And, and to give everybody an idea, um, when you get a liner shipped in, um, count on five stems the first year, 20 to 25 stems the second year, upwards to 40 to 50 stems per plant by the third year, and then wow. you're into production. Um, that's, that's what we've seen by plants directly from the breeder, planted in our ground, and we count on about three years, and you're into that 40 to 50 stem per plant range. That's so. Incredible. Yeah. And what, what spacing are you using on Snowberry? Those are the same. Um, we try and keep everything pretty standard. Um, we're six foot in between the rows and same thing about a foot and a half to two feet in between the plants themselves when we plant them out. Yeah. Okay. You could space them wider if you had the space. That's you know, right. Be That's slightly more, maybe slightly more productive, but when you're getting that closer, you're having fewer weeds in between the plants. The plants right. are just going to grow right into each other. Um, which from a weed, a weed management standpoint uh, can be can be can be pretty great. Um, and when you're done, are you, are you cutting back in the back of the ground every yes, year? Yes. Uh, my dad was out in the field last week. He pruned them all down to the ground already. So they're all ready. They're ready for the next growing season next spring as soon as it gets warm. Okay. So some porocarpus fruit flowers on new growth on new wood, and then then the berries follow. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, I, Coastal has beautiful photos, but they, you really can't, even from a photo, you can't, uh, understand how beautiful some of these berries are. Is the Red Riding Hood, are you growing that one? We don't have that one, no. Okay. Um, yeah, this is a white berry with this light pink blush on every berry. It's, uh, um, yeah, always just really, I was there, I was in Holland in August, I think, and they were just coming in, and, uh, I took just a stupid amount of photos of <laughs> berries, but... <laughs> It's hard not to when you visit them. Yeah, you mentioned um, about Colster in Boskov. It's, the, the, it's kind of the nursery center of Holland. I went there in the 90s with a university group. Um, at that point, they were still largely harvesting from canals. So the boats actually go up and down. All these little nurseries are on the canals. They're kind of irrigated from the canal water. Um, and things just grow so beautifully. Just such a, a beautiful part of Holland. Uh, I wish. I, I hope everyone can get there at some point. It's just... Lovely. Um, great. So we'll talk a little bit about Ilex. Um, also, if anyone has questions, let us know. We'll get to, I have a few questions lined up, but we, we will get to those after we've kind of touched on all of these products. Um, so Ilex, Verticillata, the winterberry holly, a um, yeah. little later season than some porocarpus. Yes. Yeah. And uh, it's, uh, we, this crop that we grow, we actually don't start harvesting them until the first week of December. Great. So um, the way we're structured, our busy Christmas shipping season is with red and yellow twig dogwood and with curly willow and everything. So the reason we could fit Ilex in was doing it as a later crop. And so we were kind of skipping, if anyone's in, uh, familiar with the porch pot theme, everyone having a decorative pot on either side of their doorstep, we kind of skipped that season with Ilex and we treat it more as a fresh cut for the floral side getting closer to Christmas. So that's kind of how we structured. But absolutely, by the second week of November here where we could harvest it, we just don't have the manpower or the time to get everything done. Okay, so, so you're still selling yellows and oranges into December? Yep, yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, kind of... and, uh, a little note. Um, and I learned this this year, so I will just pass this on. We had some orange, and I thought, oh, boy, orange Ilex in December. How is this going to work? Um, a customer told me they were actually thrilled that we had some orange in December because if you have a Jewish clientele in your market, they're not allowed to have red. Well, they maybe so, don't prefer it or go for something else. Yeah. Right. So uh, for them, they can still have the Ilex berries in their arrangements because they're orange, and not red, where you would think red is the most popular color. But uh, where we are in close proximity to Toronto, there's a lot of Jewish people there that enjoy having their houses decorated for Christmas, just like everyone else. And they just have orange ilex instead of red ilex in their porch planters. So you have to be in tune with your clientele. And so I wouldn't rule out orange ilex for sales in late November, early December. Right. As I mentioned in my previous talk about this, really perfect for American Thanksgiving. You know, yeah. late November, um, even even late October, if you wanted to, if you had any kind of Halloween sales, um, depending on where you are 
know, in, in Vermont, they would be defoliated in October anyway, so I wasn't even having to worry about the leaves. Um, do, you, do you need to sweat yours to get the leaves off, or by the time yep. you harvest, are they mostly dropping? Yeah, by the time we harvest, normally we have to pluck just a few leaves off the tips as we, as we harvest, but most of the leaves have dropped. Yeah. Um, great. Yeah, I want to... I love the yellows and I love the oranges. Obviously, red is probably has the biggest market because it's such a, you know, such a great uh, it Christmas... Does. Christmas berry. So you talk about these porch planters, that's where you just have a, you know, a big pot that you probably fill up with other evergreens and pine and so on. And then uh, the berries can be stuck in there and they just last for months. Right. Every, everyone can get an idea. Okay. Who, who do you have there? I have Ilex here in front of me. Great. And what, uh, are you growing any of the magical, the magical series? Yep. So we have, our fields are full of magical <laughs> So we have amaranth and we have winter jewel. Okay. And there was one other one. I had to pull out my list. Daydream is the orange one I believe we have. Okay. Great. We offer that one. In terms of reds, we have berry and crimson. I believe berry is a little shorter, but really plump berries. Right. Be better for shorter, maybe a shorter harvest. Yes. And crimson is capable of getting, what, four or five, six Huge. feet tall? Huge. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, and the shorter ones, um, if you're doing a lot of wreath work for Christmas time, those are perfect fit. Yeah, yeah, I'm always a little hesitant. Anything that says it's shorter, I'm like, why would I want that? But if it's still three, four feet tall, that's, that's, that's plenty cool. large. Um, so I like flowers on the previous year's growth. Yep. So on old wood, it's going to flower and then fruit. You have to have a pollinator. So we're shipping a pollinator with every 10 plants as per Colster's recommendation. So the, the male will be included with the order. Um, are you using about that ratio or do you plant? You have more yeah, males? No. Uh, yeah, we're, we're 10 to one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, in the field. And as we plant, uh, when we actually plant them in the field, we have all the females on one side and the male on the other side. And for every nine that they plant, they put a male in, and then they continue on, put another nine female, put a male in, just as we're planting them directly out in the field. Great. So for maybe someone newer to horticulture, um, there are some plants, dioecious plants, that have a male plant and a female plant. Um, most, most plants have it on the same, you know, on, on the same plant, but uh, others don't. And Ilex would be one of those that you need to make sure you have a male so you can have uh, well, the female won't make berries if you don't have the male around. So um, they're not that great to look at, but hey, they're doing the job. <laughs> That's right. Um, yeah. yeah we got, uh, we got, we got, I'm sorry. We have magical citronella, which is kind of the bright yellow. Um, a bit of crest gold, which is kind of a golden orange. And then daydream, I think, is the more, the deeper orange. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, sold out. And most of those, we do still have some of the, some citronella and some crimson. Um, what sizes are you seeing on your Ilex? um like height wise yeah well this is still all new to us because our ilex plants only came in three years ago and so we're still learning the max growth uh that they can provide us so this was actually our first year of harvest that we got to harvest off of the plants that we uh got in from colster so we're learning just like everybody else great so it, the Cool part about Alex, if you don't harvest it this year, you can just leave that stem on the yeah. plant and it will get another foot, maybe 18 more inches of growth the next year. And they're gonna have these really massive stems. I think I, you know, at, at the ASDFG meeting, I bought some some stems in from Holland and I think I was paying eight, nine dollars a stem. I mean, when you get a really tall Ilex, that's a premium product that will get a premium price. Yep. Um, yeah, yeah. And he was gonna let everyone know like, uh, when you place an order with Bailey, um, because um, how we harvest them is we split our fields into two halves and we harvest one half while the other half is putting on its growth for the summer. And then the following year we'll go into the other half of the field and that is what we will harvest while the other half of the field is growing for the next season because it's you have to harvest on old wood. So be conscious when you order because you harvest the same way we do, you will harvesting only five plants while you let the other five plants grow for the following year. So be conscious of if you want production out of 10 plants, you may have to bump up your order to be able to harvest off your 10 plants year over year over year. 
Does that kind of make sense to everyone? <clears throat> What's that? Does that kind of make sense to everyone? Yeah, yeah, let me let me just repeat that because I think it's really important. So some things like Symphora carpus, they bloom on new growth. So you can cut them back to the ground every year. They're going to regrow, reflower, and refruit every season. Other crops like Ilex, which bloom on old wood, you're going to have to have that one summer, the plant's going to grow, and then it needs to go through winter. The next year, it will flower and then fruit. So it's almost an 18-month cycle. So if you have half your, you know, if you want to harvest every year, you need to have them in kind of opposite, opposite schedules, um, one year on, one year off. Now you can also leave them for a grow for a third year if you want something really tall or even a fourth year if you want something just extraordinary. Um, yeah, I think that's a really, a really great point. The male, the male can hang out. You can probably print it back if it's getting unruly, yep. but the, the females, I think it's a really, really good idea to plant, you know, plant two batches or, or, or prune them accordingly. Um, they take what, three years to establish. Mine seem to kind of sit there the first year, then the second yeah. year I saw some growth and third year I really saw yeah, we, did. we uh we actually planted them in a field that we thought they would do great and they actually didn't do very well in that field so we actually ended up taking them all out throwing them in our cooler over the winter and planting into a different field the following spring so we almost lost a year between that whole fiasco so we're just we don't have all the answers we're learning as we go too so don't feel like uh if they don't do very well in a spot, you can you can dig them up and you find find a better spot or a better soil for them. So it was actually a low spot on the farm. We thought they would do great and they didn't do so good. So they ended up getting planted in a section of the farm that is on straight sand and they've done phenomenal there. So okay. don't feel don't feel like you have to plant them in the lowest wettest part of your farm. We have them planted on pure sand beach soil is basically what we're farming on and they they did accept it well so great that's really good advice i i happen to have heavy clay soil when i had them in vermont and they were pretty happy on that um but you see them in bogs and as you're saying even even well-drained soil will work as long as they are getting irrigated yep. um yeah i love ilex for just a lot of i'm not sure i can grow it uh, here in my new home and i i kind of miss it but you know there's some trade-offs um Great. Um, you're growing. Well, I've got some more, more things to talk about. Are you are you growing any Calicarpa? Are you too cold up there? No Calicarpa. That, <laughs> okay. was, uh, that was a case of we can't do everything. Yeah. Um, Calicarpa are great, especially if you're in a little warmer zone. I think these might be hardy to six. There are Calicarpas that are, you know, native well into Florida. Um, so for southern southern growers, look at that Calicarpa, the beauty berry. I mean, I've seen it well up into southern New England. I think it could probably as things are warming, could probably go even further north than that. Um, but another berry, another berry product, these happen to be bright purple. Um, we had white ones that are sold out for this season, but we'll have them next year. Um, really, I really just shocking. A lot of people have never seen them before and they, they stop you in your tracks when you, when you see them. Um, let's talk a little bit about hydrangea. I know you, you grow quite a few. Yeah. Um, so like everyone that probably is growing or dabbling in cut hydrangeas, we started with limelight over 20 years ago, um, which the plants are still in production. Right. Uh, and then uh, we go back to that trip to Holland five years ago and I saw, um, oh, Bill, you got to remind me, magical candle. Candle. Magical, yeah, magical candle. And uh, so same thing, we got some in as a trial, just a trial. And I was blown away. I, I had been used to limelight and limelight served a purpose, but um, this was actually the last year that Green Park Nurses will be growing limelight hydrangeas. Everything is getting switched over to magical can. I think that's an endorsement. <laughs> so there is, there is your endorsement. It is... Uh, it's an amazing flower. It, it, it truly is. Um, and one other variety that we're growing that I don't think too many people will be able to get because it's kind of exclusive to Green Park Nurseries is uh, we have Magical Ruby Snow Hydrangea. And so that one was kind of came in as a patent to us um, just as a code and we trialed it. And we had the first 350 cuttings made exclusively for Green Park Nurseries. And my daughter actually got to name the plant. So uh, that, that is uh, 
those will be the two varieties that we'll be moving forward with. So, but uh, yeah, amazing, amazing varieties of hydrangeas that Colster has. Um, I agree. Yeah, I was there, like I said, in August. There were a couple that I, maybe they weren't being, uh, they weren't tagged to be saved, but I'm like, this, this is the one I want. <laughs> like maybe, maybe it doesn't have landscape potential, but can you maybe set this one aside for the cut people? Um, <clears throat> even late in the season, it was still pure white and not, not blushing at all. I'm like, pure, pure white is, is helpful sometimes. <laughs> um, so I, uh, Hydrangea paniculata is they flower on new growth. So you yep. can cut them back every year. How how low are you pruning yours each season? Um, if if I we are pruning them, basically we're leaving a two to three inch nub on the season's growth. Does that kind okay. of makes sense. Um, right. So and and what happens is is when you're pruning on the same bush for over 20 years, you know we do have hydrangea plants that are almost three feet tall, but just simply because that two inches two inches at a time, they'll they'll get there. Yeah. yeah. So we are pruning them quite heavy. So the my experience, the lower you cut them, you get larger blooms. If you leave larger. cut them a little higher, maybe they're trying to put out more flowers, which restricts the height. So limelight's the classic one. If you cut it all the way to the ground, you're going to get something bigger than your head. It's going to be almost unusable. Yeah. But if you cut them maybe eh, a little bit below your knee, depending on how tall you are, you're going to get uh, more stems, but uh, more stems with a smaller head. And I think you'll probably end up making more money on them, more transportable, easier for the designers to use. Yeah. So experiment a little bit. Maybe you have a farmer's market where you could sell a giant, you know, 18 inch wide flower that they're very, they're very impressive, but just a little bit hard to transport and maybe not something your wedding, your wedding designers will go after. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, and if you're planning on growing, uh, PG hydrangeas or that, that type, uh, shade is your friend. Okay. Tell me about that. Do you, when do you put your shade structure up? I, I remember seeing it and being quite jealous of it uh, a couple a few years back. Yeah. So we normally the end of July, middle 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 to end of july um just the flowers have formed but the uh but the petals haven't come out yet okay. so that that's when we'll put all the shade on <laughs> so the shade is if you don't put the shade up your the water droplets on the flowers almost act like magnifying glasses and when you get that morning sun it'll it kind of burn and leave spots all of your flowers is that correct that's correct um, and you get some little brown browning bits within the flower, and it's just less less marketable. <coughs> so you may not need it. I mean, look around, see what's happening with other paniculata hydrangeas in your area. But yeah. if you're seeing them spotty, try some shade cloth. It might just prevent um, prevent those spots from ever forming. Bailey, you have to excuse me for one moment. Okay. <laughs> I'll be back. Okay, I'll be right here. Um, so I've got a couple questions already. We are actually going to restock some of these items. We have more hydrangea on the way. Um, if you want some of these products and we're sold out, just hit that notify me button. That's how we will let you know. We won't have a big, you know, we, we won't have the full, uh, we're not getting hundreds and hundreds more of all of these, but we will have some more. So hit the little notify me button if it's sold out and you will be notified. We're not going to send an email out this time. It'll just be for your information if you have identified yourself as somebody who wants to be notified. Um, I think we may have some more Philadelphia's as well. Definitely hydrangea. Um, peonies, we'll have some, uh, some more bare root peonies coming and some more uh, silby. So just let us know um, if you are interested by hitting that notify me button and you'll be the first person, uh, well, along with everyone else who's hit that button. But we won't, we won't tell all, we, we won't make a big deal out of it, but we'll let you know. Um, so walk, we're waiting for Carl to come back here. Um, let me just see if we have any questions that I can answer. Obviously, Carl knows a lot more about woody plants than I do. Um, <laughs> Sorry, everyone. I've, hey. uh, I'm just getting over a chest cold, and now I have this annoying dry cough. So I, I did good so far, but the amount of talking. <laughs> I'll try to take it easy on you here. Um, I was saying we are actually, we sold a lot of what we have pre-ordered from Colster and I've gone back to them and they're able to restock us with some things. The hydrangea are actually coming in from Maryland. They're not coming in from Holland. So they're already in the U.S. Um, some things just have to go through a weird quarantine process 
to be sold in America, but we're getting more hydrangea. Um, we're getting some more Philadelphia's as well. So uh, even though we sold out of some things, it will be back um, for spring shipping, which is really great news. Um, Cotinus, do you grow as for cut foliage, right? Yes, we do. So uh, we do a lot of uh, royal purple. Okay. And then, uh, but we don't do any, I think what culture has magic fountain. Let me check here. Yes. Okay. So we are actually growing um, Magical Torch, which you've probably seen at the farm. And yes. <clears throat> so that is a Cotinus that gives you the smoke effect or blooms on new growth. So uh, we know in the springtime where you kind of get that a smoke effect on older wood. Um, sometimes it's the wrong time of year to have it. Everybody wants that as a fall color. So right. when I was in Holland visiting the breeder, I saw that and told them I need that and I need it now. So even <laughs> that time, we had to wait a couple years <clears throat> until they had enough in production. So and as far as I believe, we were the first ones in North America to receive the first thousand plants. So, yeah, I believe uh, that we'll have that for 2025. Okay. Um, so the difference, so Cotinus generally blooms on old wood. You have to have one year of growth, then it goes dormant for winter, then it's going to flower in the second year. Um, that's really not a problem if you're cutting for foliage. It's a really excellent foliage, beautiful, you know, red and burgundy tones. You could harvest for foliage, no problem, or you can wait until the next year to get the smoke. Um, I think they call it what, wig? Yeah. Wig, wig tree or something, because it does kind of look like a wig. I think maybe I need to photo shoot with uh, Cotinus hair. Um, there is a new, a new series out there that will flower, will flower and make that smoky effect on the first year's growth, um, but it is still in really short supply. But I've been told we should be able to source that for 2025. So don't be go on and try the, well, we're out of it now. I'll try to get more. Um, That's because one Carl foliage is great, but also why not, why not plant both? Grow one for foliage and one for flowers. Yep. Um, great. I'm going to go over to some questions. I think we've touched on the main groups of plants that we are offering. Um, and I do have a good handful of questions here. <laughs> I have a note that uh, your son Carson popped on to say hi, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the whole family's involved. Absolutely, you, you do have a family business, so we do. Except, except he doesn't work for his dad anymore. He works for somebody else. Ooh, <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Um, someone's asked about deer pressure on these varieties. I see lots of winterberry growing in the wild. This is in Rhode Island. Um, yep. Can any of these? Plants. A lot of them are, happen to be Native American plants, or they are derived from Native North American plants. Um, do you find any of them are more or less uh, prone to deer predict deer deer snacks? So, so we have more deer than people where we're living. Yeah, and we've yet to have an issue. Okay. Now, that very farm to farm, region to region. I can only speak on what's happening at our farm. Um, we have had a single problem with deer pressure on any of the varieties from Colster that we're growing here on the farm. Right. So, and even um, with the Ilex berries, I've heard a lot of people talking about bird pressure. Even for that, we haven't had a single bird pressure issue on our Ilex for them coming in and eating the berries. Um, we don't have any netting or anything over our Ilex in the fields and never had an issue with birds for that crop. So. As far as pests that could damage crops, I've yet to find one where we are right now. So, good news. Um, I remember up in Vermont, Third Branch Flower Farm, um, sort of by Ed Pincus, who was kind of a, a big name in ASCFG. He passed away before I could meet him, but okay. he, I saw um, his son, his son and daughter-in-law took it over. And their problem was moose. The moose would come in and maybe graze the tops of. Uh, I think they mainly their dogwood, so they would get all these kind of shrubby, brushy things. They couldn't get a long whip because the moose would come in. So if you have yep. a lot of moose, maybe a problem, but hopefully deer won't be a big issue 
for you with these particular varieties. Um, yeah, I think if you left, if you didn't harvest your winter berry in early December, probably by January, February, the birds are getting hungry, they're gonna go for it. But by and large, the harvest is over before the birds get hungry enough to find them tasty. Yeah. Um, let's see, my good friend, Linda Doan down in Tennessee. Um, my winter berry red eye, red eye looks, hasn't buried in a long time, just a berry here and there. Seems to form in the spring, but never makes it to a full berry. Is there a pollinator, Southern gentleman? So Linda, I'm guessing if you're not seeing berries, it's probably just, you don't have a pollinator close enough to your plant. If you're seeing it flower in the springtime, um, the, classic, the classic reason you wouldn't see berries would simply be you don't have a pollinator close enough to the plant. Yeah. Um, Carl, you mentioned black spots on snowberry leaves and how the colster varieties seem to be resistant to that. Uh, what is that black spot? Is it a bacterial thing or a fungal thing? I don't think it's a, uh, I would think it's a fungal thing. Um, like, I, I think that's why uh, snowberry got such a bad rap early on in the early years, um, you know, was because everyone wanted perfect leaves to go along with their snowberry. And, uh, these new bread varieties absolutely have solved that issue. Um, so, but as far as the black spot, I would think it's a fungal issue, but I, I can't remember the old varieties yet. I was still young when my dad tried those. So, okay. Um, where they're growing in the Netherlands is very humid, whatever, you know, either fungal or bacterial are encouraged by humid conditions. So they've been grown in a place where they would probably be getting these same kind of diseases. And I'm sure they're selecting for the most resistant. Uh, they're pretty ruthless when it comes time to selecting, Absolutely. only keeping the best of the best of the best. Um, question, how, how tall does Ilex get in your, in your one, two, three? Um, year one, you're probably, well, you want it centimeters or inches? Depends where we can, we can, we can convert. I'm, I'm, I'm learning. <laughs> um, First year, we harvested a lot of 65 to 70 centimeter. Okay. Um, our first year. So, a little over two uh, foot. Yeah, a little over two feet. Um, the next year, the next harvest, I would imagine everything probably right around that three foot mark, around 100 centimeter, which is primarily the size that everyone is kind of looking for. And the year after that, you probably gain meter six inches on top of that um, okay. if, if you're cutting back hard every single season to promote that growth in one year i i, I imagine you'll top out around that three okay. foot mark so maybe roughly roughly a foot roughly a foot a year like yeah we said first year but the first year is really the second year because you're not cutting the first year's growth the first year won't flower make berries so not that like second third fourth year um so probably the sweet spot is I mean, you, you can sell them uh, as a two to three foot stem. It's probably the sweet spot in the harvest. Otherwise, you, know, you will gain a little bit of money by leaving them on the plant another year, but the premium market is probably smaller. Um, so I'm saying, can snowberry be grown in a two by two by two pot? I'm assuming those are feet. Um, I don't know why you wouldn't, you couldn't grow it in a, in a container. I don't, if that, if, yeah, if you need to. Why not? Now the only thing is, is uh, um, what are the winter months like? Um, right. If that pot is just left outside, um, out to the elements and freezing temperatures, um, I can almost guarantee you it won't survive if it's just in a pot and it's going down to minus 20 Celsius or, I don't know, you'll have to do the conversion, Bailey. In, yeah. in, in <laughs> Minus 20 is very cold. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and a minus 35 is about the same in Fahrenheit or Celsius. Um, yeah, great point. If you are growing in containers, bring those woody plants inside in a minimally heated or, I mean, yeah. that could drop a little below freezing, but the roots are much more tender than the top growth is. Yeah. You know, obviously and, the ground is not freezing as rapidly as the air is. And I would go as far as even if you wanted to plant them in a raised bed, I know, some people are doing that now with putting two by tens or two by twelves and filling them up with soil. I would be in on on also planting them in a raised. Bed. I, I would say plant them directly into the ground to keep those roots uh, in the ground all winter. Great. Um, Carl, someone's asking if you grow any hydrangea macrophylla. 
We do not. Um, we have tried. I thought I remember wish, you telling me about your experiment. And and I wish and I wish I could, but uh, just our zone and our climate where we are, it is it is just it's just too cold. Um, when, when they need to be flowering on on old wood, um, the the stems it just gets too cold during the winter, and the stems they uh, they just die back so hard that uh, it's almost impossible for us to grow. Uh, yeah, mob head or macrophilia hydrangeas, where we are. Um, so I think we're listing ruby red, really beautiful, you know, just it's a ruby. What's that? It's a gorgeous color. Absolutely. And it ages to this, not quite black, but this really lovely burgundy wine color if you leave it on the plant. Um, so if you're in maybe a milder winter place, that would be a great one to try. If you see the blue hydrangeas blooming around you, then you're in the right location for these to survive. But as Carl said, they, they prefer to bloom on the previous year's growth. They might survive. The plant will live if it gets too cold, but the flower bud is much more tender and uh, it, it can die. So you, if, you, if you've had these blue hydrangeas that just don't flower for you, it's probably because you're getting a cold snap at the wrong time and you're losing, losing that bud tissue, but the, the plant will go on and survive. Um, I know this one is a rebloomer. It will bloom on new growth as well, but your best blooms will probably be on the previous year's growth. See who else we got here. Um, someone's asking about what age are the roots. So everything we're selling are year old. They were transplanted out last spring in Holland. They've actually been sheared, I think, three times. So you get lots of branching. The structure is really nice on the plants that Colster is producing. Um, yeah, they look they look older than that to me. But the plants are probably I don't know anywhere between twelve to eighteen inches tall with the root system to match. They're really really happy plants. Um, someone asked if islets can take weed pressure, they want to plant them along a stream that's full of vegetation. Um, I, I would say it depends on the weeds. <laughs> Some weeds will swallow them and others if they're well behaved. Uh, I have an answer for that. We have a little patch in the back corner of our farm by the pond. And I swear there's more goldenrod in the rows than there are ilex plants. And they've done just fine. Okay. Do I End it? Absolutely not. But uh, they will grow amongst some weed pressure and even perennial weed pressure matter. But I don't recommend it. Right. If you look in, uh, I don't know, around us in Vermont, we have, there are a lot of kind of boggy, swampy areas, and there'd be cattails and all sorts of stuff directly out of the roots of Ilex for just a lot of, and they would still get a really nice size and fruit very well. So I'd say it's possible, but also uh, I don't think that's going to be your best production. Um, someone asked about, does ruby red turn blue or will it stay red in acidic soils? And I don't know the answer to that, but email us and I can find out. I know a lot of these have been bred um, to be less pH dependent than the older varieties. Um, I'm sure you can turn it one color or the other. You might push it towards purple in one, one way or pinker in the other direction. But uh, I'm sure Colster will know and be happy to tell us. Okay, that's it for my questions. Um, any closing remarks from the sick man? Um, no, thank you for having me on. I hope this was educational for everybody that tuned in. Um, yeah, even uh, if you have questions that come in later on, if you follow us on Instagram, I'm the one in charge. I'd be glad to happy to help if anyone has any questions. Uh, related to growing or what things are like also. So uh, I'm here to help too. Um, I'm, I'm glad Bailey got um, Colster rounded up to start getting these varieties out to everyone because, you know, I'm a firm believer too that when you get the public educated and variety specific, it helps all of us, big or small, and it helps everyone in their sales. I know even uh, for the snowberry varieties, I'm a large grower. There's a lot of florists and a lot of event planners that got burned by the old snowberry varieties where they would order it in and it would just come in not looking very nice. So we are all on an education mission to the North American market to everyone because we have to re-educate all our consumers all over again about how special these varieties are and that they've been bred specifically 
for the florists and the event planners and for weddings and funeral work and everything. So uh, I, I may be a big grower, but we are absolutely all on the same page and trying to spread the word. So I'm here for you guys. Great. Yeah, I think uh, quali quality will always sell. It doesn't matter what size grower you are. If you if you can grow a good a good stem, you can sell it. And it really and many, many times uh, means starting with the right variety. So I'm glad we're getting I'm, I'm, I'm pretty excited. It's been a little passion project of mine for a while. Um, I meant earlier to talk about uh, woody cut stems for growers and florists. Um, to my knowledge, the best book on the topic of growing woody plants for the cut trade. Um, ASCFG will sell this to you. They've been promoting it lately, so I know they have it in stock. Might be a great Christmas gift for yourself. Now, some of the varieties might be a little outdated, but the culture of these plants doesn't really change over the decades because, well, they're the same plant. So uh, I recommend this book as a starting point. Obviously, do a lot of trialing yourself. If something isn't working, move it and try it somewhere else. Talk to another person who is succeeding with it. Um, this, you know, anything you read in a book, take with a grain of salt. It might not perfectly match your conditions, but it's a really great starting point if you don't know much about the topic to start with. All right, Carl, I appreciate your time. Um, yeah, I was excited to see your message come in. Um, you've always been really open and sharing um, with your information. And I know a lot of people have learned from you. And uh, let's, keep, let's keep teaching each other how to do this. Sounds good. All right. Thanks so much, hey. Carl. Yeah. Right. Bye. All right, everyone. We're, uh, I'm going to sign off here. Thanks for participating. Like I said, we will be restocking a good number of these products. So hit that little notify me button. That'll let us know how to let you know that we have these plants back in stock. All right, take care.